Welcome to episode 33 of the Croydon Constitutionalist podcast, bringing classical liberalism to South London and beyond via our YouTube channel and wherever you get your podcasts. My name is Dan Heaton and my partner in podcasting today is Mike Swaddling, the co-founder of the Croydon Constitutionalists. Mike, how are you doing? Uh, yeah, good, Dan. Um, uh, the weather's, the world's brightened up, the world's opening up and uh, all is good. Excellent. Glad to hear it. And we are joined on the podcast today by Alistair Donald, the Associate Director of the Academy of Ideas. Alistair, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm fine, thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, It's nice weather outside, as Michael says. Uh, Frustrating times, but uh, good to have some weather that's okay. So, Mike, what have we got to discuss today? Yeah, so our normal uh, update on the world of COVID and what's happening here. Brexit update and some more project cheer to bring you. Um, Roads must fall and the uh, current concerns around statues. Uh, Speaking to Alistair and and taking through some questions and our usual roundup of what to do to stay busy. So yes, COVID, the lockdown continues. For the past week, non-essential shops have been open and face masks have been compulsory on public transport. How vigorously that's being enforced, particularly on buses, I'm uh, I'm not too sure. Uh, certainly in London, where the uh, the bus driver is at the at the the front of the bus and people having to get onto the bus in the middle, I'm not convinced that he's uh, paying any much attention to that. But uh, but certainly, some many people are are using face masks. The alert level, as it's been described, has now been dropped from four to three. Uh, So the virus is in general circulation and social distancing has been relaxed. I don't think, as I speak, that there's been an official announcement yet, but it's being widely trailed that uh, as of the 4th of July, the two metre social distancing requirements going to be dropped down to one metre. And uh, hopefully that will pave the way for restaurants and uh, and pubs to reopen uh, because it will be uh, easier for them to uh, to work in those conditions. Mike, are the pubs going to reopen? Oh, I severely hope so. Um, you know, we, we, we're week 13 of our three week lockdown um, and, and 13 weeks without going to the pub. has got to be the longest since I was about 15 years old. Um, <laughs> But fortunately, those pubs no longer exist, so you can't blame anyone. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's we really need to get the world opening up. Uh, this very late announcement on the pubs that there appears to be in terms of social distancing is slightly worrying. I happen to, um, as you do now, have all you bumped into uh, uh, the bar manager of a local pub to meet whilst I was queuing at the supermarket. Um, and that's that's where all my conversations seem to happen with people face to face now. Um, and, and he'd said that they they'd spec it out. They knew what they were doing, what the numbers were based on, obviously, a two metre rule. Now, if that changes and they open up next week, um, it, it's late in the day. I mean, br- change it, bring it down. Absolutely. But it's very late in the day. And it does seem that the government's not uh, really thinking about the practicalities of businesses opening at the moment. Alistair, are you looking forward to uh, Independence Day? Uh, Yeah, definitely looking forward to it. I mean, the pubs is interesting, isn't it? Because I I think for anybody that really wants to, you can already get a drink in pubs, actually, Uh, especially in London. If you go out and about and perhaps off the main streets, then there are pubs that are open uh, for takeaway beers in a formal sense. But, you know, you can get in and get a pint and uh, sit outside in the street with your mates and and have a beer. So that's kind of quite good, I think. Um, The problem is, though, that I think uh, when I went the other day, day uh people are regimentally stood in queues some lots of people have got face masks on uh there's a kind of 
um, order to the whole uh, situation of getting a drink, which is um, in some ways inimical to the whole experience of actually going out and enjoying a beer. And I suppose that's my worry is that uh, as we get into this uh, opening situation, and lots of people are talking just now about getting the, you know, the social distance down from two metres to one metre, which in many ways obviously is a good thing because it will help things to open up. My worry, I suppose, is that we're institutionalising a wider set of uh, arrangements on, on on social distancing, even at one metre, which is um, all about instilling a certain sort of atomization within society and a kind of uh, a suspicion, really, of, of your fellow citizens that, they, you, you know, we're being asked to consider them a threat rather than uh, someone that you want to get near and uh, have a conversation with. So I think that's a that that is a worry just now that um, the technical measures to lift these things uh, might be coming to some extent. We don't know to what extent, but some of the uh, stuff that you really want to see, which is the re-emergence of a sociable society, is, is to me, it seems quite a long way off. Alice has raised a couple of really interesting points there, a good point, in terms of how we interact with each other. And it struck me with this need to get on buses uh, with, with face masks. And I, I've seen this myself, I got a bus the other day, um, and probably half the people had a face mask on at most. Um, same with the train. It, it was it was during the middle of the day, it was sunny, you got on the bus, it wasn't a big deal. Not convinced how comfortable and how much more pleasant the travelling experience will be late at night when it's miserable weather um, with a bus full of people, half of whom have masks covering their faces. It doesn't feel like that's going to engender a safe feeling for everyone. Um, the issue with pubs as well, and, and this is something I, I do want to say, at the moment, and it may by the time people listen to this have already changed, there is talk of people needing to register to go to the pub. And it just, it just feels to me that there is a a set of um, civil servants, probably predominantly, people in charge, and I've felt this all along through this lockdown, that will use this as an opportunity to change the things they don't like in society. Um, you know, the football's back playing now, which is great, but obviously you can't go to a game, not something I imagine many of the, the people in charge would often do. Uh, going down the pub, well, you better register, because frankly, we don't really like the fact you're going down the pub. It's a little bit conspiratorial of me to say that, but it does feel like that could be a very worrying trend that's coming our way. Yeah, it doesn't feel to me like it's overly conspiratorial, to be honest. It feels like an extension of trends that have been in existence for some time. It's the officious society, really, isn't it, where the busybody rules uh, with a set of regulations and a uh, set of licensing rules that uh, dictate what's permissible, which I think is 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 a real problem. Well, the uh, the busybodies haven't been doing uh, too well recently with the uh, the talk of a track and trace app. Um, it sounds like the government's now given up on uh, trying to do it its own thing and is going to go with a uh, a solution from uh, from Google and Apple. Um, and hot off the press, uh, I believe this afternoon in the uh, in the House of Lords, it's been revealed that the NHS's COVID tracing app has cost the taxpayer. 11.8 million pounds and it's not going to be used always buy not build a anyone anyone in it knows that anyone in, in the it industry unless you're doing something completely new and innovative that's that's you know you can't buy the product always buy not build if there's a base for running one of these apps that's written by the the same company that wrote the operating system you want to run it on you buy that um crazy decision at the start yeah, I mean, you've got to say, though, that uh, Google and um, Apple having our information is nothing really to celebrate, is it? I mean, there's been all sorts of concerns over the past uh, years of of the amount of information that they collect on us all. So I, I think just because it shifted to Google and Apple is 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 nothing to celebrate, really. But the bigger point, perhaps, is is uh, I mean, obviously the money is, is, is a huge waste, but it's the inability of, of those within government to implement 
want or to to imagine and then develop and then implement a solution that's going to get us out of this situation. I mean, it's no news to anyone that uh, the ability to track and then trace people has been seen as one of the solutions to get us moving again. And they've had three months now to think about this. They went through a long period of uh, deliberating over which system to go with. Anybody who's seen uh, any technology solution that's got anything to do with the NHS or indeed any uh, government departments would have been suspicious weeks ago that uh, this was never going to happen in the end. And it does seem to me indicative of a government which has lost all its moral authority and all its ability to act uh, in a leadership sense within society to actually get us out of this mess. It's, it's uh, uh, reluctantly, perhaps, depending on who you believe, implement the lockdown, but without any uh, thought given in advance to the set of uh, solutions that's going to need to be created to bring us out of it. And I think it's really problematic. Yeah, it seems that they're, uh, they're an administration, but they're not really governing. There's no... There's, as you say, there's not much thought going into it. Um, and in any event, after, you know, what we now over three months in, um, we now know that a large proportion of the population who may contract the condition and um, be infectious uh, don't have any symptoms. Well, if you don't have any symptoms, you're very unlikely to get yourself tested. So if then you won't actually... Uh, be any use for the uh, the track and trace app for um, for anybody else to uh, to be told about you having contracted the illness and been in the vicinity of them. So it does seem a bit uh, a bit silly to be to be going forward with this. And uh, Alistair, as you say, we don't particularly want Google or Apple knowing uh, too much more about us than they uh, than they already do. Yeah, I, th I think, I mean, if you put it in the context of, of what else has been going on, there's been over the last few weeks just a series of uh, decisions which seem to almost immediately overturn uh, decisions that have been taken, whether it's on free school lunches or uh, even indeed the, with the wider opening up of schools was a commitment that was then overturned. There's been the ongoing situation with whether to introduce quarantine, which has come now, but nobody seems to believe that it's going to last for very long because it makes no sense uh, given it wasn't done weeks ago when it actually might have made some sort of difference. So I, I, I think the, the lack of leadership within government is one of the, the key things at the moment. Society is looking just now for solutions to be able to open up. And I saw the other day there was um, one of the pubs, I think it was Oakman Inns it was called, uh, which said, uh, we can't wait for you, Boris. We're opening on 4th of July or whatever. And it does seem indicative of a way that there's more kind of decisive leadership within society at large through normal people or businesses who are suffering through all this and who have some sort of commitment to getting us out of this mess than there is uh, in, in central government and, and those that rule over us. And that's again. It's, it, you're absolutely right. It, it would have been understandable at the start of this if they didn't quite know what they were going to do, what the game plan was. But actually, the people that prepare for pandemics in government seem to be pretty prepared. They, the legislation came along, the initial lockdown was put in, um, the phase closing down of things happened. To me, it seems quite quite sensibly uh, uh, and and quickly. Whether you thought it was the right thing to do or not, and, and certainly I've had questions, I, that seemed to work. As the lockdown's gone on, they've actually got less in control of what's going on. And and, and in terms of, um, you've mentioned it there, they're, they're an administration rather than government. The trouble we've seen in central London the last couple of weeks, the trouble in Bristol, and we might come on to some of that, but it really is a case of people saying, you've lost the plot now. Um, I can't go to the pub because the pub isn't open near me. But any rule you bring in government, I'm not listening anymore because I just don't believe you. I don't have faith in you. And that's a really bad place for us to be as a country, particularly when we do have um, a pandemic going on. Well, on a uh, perhaps more cheery note, if we uh, if we can move on at this stage. Yes, Liz Truss, the, um, the Trade Secretary, has been um, out there, out in the big wide world, or at least via Zoom or Skype or what have you, at least. Um, in discussions with Australia. It looks like we're going to be having a, a pretty decent trade deal with our cousins in the uh, Antipodes. And she's saying that the uh, the trade agreement, which 
is going to be done by the end of the year, they say, uh, will be a, an example of what future trade deals can be. Um, interesting and, and perhaps something um, you don't often see in the trade deals. Um, they're looking to uh, put in a chapter there to uh, to assist the uh, small and medium sized enterprise businesses. Uh, often free trade deals seem to be to the benefit of large companies i've noticed over the years but uh could be uh could be an interesting uh could be an interesting trade deal this um mike sounds good to me absolutely this was the whole point of breaking free of the european union being able to to look around the world at where we can ease trade and, and make things cheaper um fantastic clearly we've got a natural affinity to australia um i was out there fortunate enough to be out there at the back end of last year um it's it's an obvious place for people to go and try and do business um it's a, a really expanding country you can see what all the amount of stuff that's going on the amount of building the amount of just dynamism in that economy and why would we not want to get closer to that um and if we can get it started for the end of the year superb some good news at last alistair um, yes, I, I, I think uh, as an example, as, as a symbolic gesture, uh, as has as been uh, hinted at, I, th- I think then, yes, you've got to welcome this. I think probably worth putting in perspective here, and I'm not wanted to be the one in this podcast that always puts the downside, but it is four years tomorrow since the referendum. Uh, and we've not got very far in that four years. And you could say, in fact, just to link it back to the to the, to the last discussion on, on Corona, coronavirus that it's it's really we've only got this far because the people have pushed it in that direction rather than the government uh, ha- have led it um, uh, when I looked at the the figures the other day Australia seems to be about the 19th on the list of countries that we uh, do business with New Zealand seems somewhere down in the 40s so they're fairly minor in terms of the countries as uh, that we do uh, uh, business with and I, I think the, the perhaps the, the bigger thing is the the uh, how the trade deal with the European Union is going to conclude because that seems to me to be the the big thing just now and there's some uh, uh, excitement there from some people that it, it seems to be pushing towards uh, a realistic prospect of doing some sort of deal there but uh, out of these discussions seem to become becoming hints that uh, some of it's going to be pushed over into next year so it's going to be uh, uh, pushed through in a way that actually not going to resolve all the issues and even that we could be left at the behest of uh, institutions within the European Union and attached to the European Union uh, as governing forces over over what we do in the future so I think there's a uh, this is is not completely a cause for celebration yet there's a lot of work and and it needs to be pushed through and you almost fear that uh, this moment of pandemic uh, and the focus all all being on that, you 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 worry what's going on in the background because the the history of uh, ach- trying to achieve Brexit has always been to push discussions and to push debate with it into the public sphere rather than allow these things to be concluded in in, in deals in sm- not smoky rooms anymore but back rooms. Yeah, I mean there's 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 no doubt that the the deal with the European Union is uh, is, is going to be important um, at least from restricting the, the the amount of friction on trade uh, at the ports really i suspect what might happen is that there is a an agreement to have an agreement at least covering certain areas and um and that trade will probably continue in goods at least um pretty much as it is at the moment uh, because even if there are further negotiations to be to be had um i'm pretty certain that the uh, the government knows that it uh, it can't go extending the uh, the transition period uh, now. Well, in fact, uh, officially it uh, it would be illegal now. Although um, with a with a stonking majority, as somebody once said, um, I suppose they could push something through there. Um, but of course, that deal that they may then uh, sign with the European Union, there may be things in there which make it more difficult to have trade deals with other countries such as in, in particular is in the the agricultural sector for example um, so it is it is important not to uh, to get too enthusiastic about 
as you say, deals which uh, with countries which at the moment we don't do as much trade with. But of course, if you have a free trade deal, uh, we may do more trade, if, especially if we've got um, cultural ties there which make trading better. But we also have some 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 good news. Um, you'll recall that um, Toyota in Sunderland uh, recently affirmed their commitment to uh, making cars uh, there for the European market. Uh, well, there's now uh, going to be a new hybrid made uh, from Suzuki in uh, in Derbyshire. Uh, so this is a bit of a project chair there. Uh, Mike, great news for the uh, the British manufacturing industry. Yes, it is, it is very good news. And it it's kind of what was always going to be the case um, as a result of Brexit, either way, that businesses make decisions for a variety of reasons. Um, it's how productive your workforce is, how easy it is to get goods to market, um, what the relative value of the currencies are, what trading relationships you've got. And, and what trading relationship is an important reason, but it turns out it's just one of many reasons. And it turns out that, you know, the British workforce is pretty productive and and they want to put work here because Britain is broadly a good place to do business. And, and you know, there will always be better places, but we are broadly a good place to do business. So, yeah, very good news. Um, and it does. It, it What was always a nonsense around the, uh, the amount of stuff that would close down if we ended up being in a in a WTO situation with the EU has finally been proved to be really really nonsensical I, th- I think the point that you made dan about at, at the end there about new zealand and, and australia and and changing the level of business is, is a good one this this shouldn't really be just about um reinforcing what we already do but trying to do something different and in that respect i i, I do really agree with you i worry a little bit about uh this idea of britain being a good place to do business with i mean maybe it is maybe it isn't um but the but it goes hand in hand with the sentiment that I see coming out of government uh, a lot just now and, and has been for some time, really, which is that the, the basics are fundamentally sound, is the, the phrase that they, they, they often use. And I just think that's a really questionable view, actually. I think one of the problems with the British economy is that for the past 40 years, um, productivity is actually, the, the increases have actually been very poor across most of that period. In fact, I think uh, since the term of the 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 millennium um, more than half of british businesses haven't had any productivity increase at all and the rest of them uh, most of them have have barely reached one percent in increasing productivity so i think this idea that uh, the uk economy is fundamentally sound is 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 a problematic one and that for me was one of the great benefits of brexit actually was that that very process of extracting ourselves from a, a set of existing arrangements uh could be quite a creative one in the sense that it gave us the opportunity to review everything that we do and to put in place entirely new sets of arrangements for how we do things. So all the regulations uh, that have come to us through our uh, being members of the European Union, you might not want to get rid of all of them, but some of them, um, because we're reviewing them, we would have the capacity to, to, to get rid of them and thereby create a momentum around doing new things. And I think that's really important. And again, my worry about this pandemic period is that a lot of these uh, aspirations are being pushed aside or at least not talked about at the moment and we really need them to uh, I think come back to the centre of the agenda. You mentioning productivity there just uh, it, one of the things that certainly I hoped out of uh, less free movement of people would be businesses would have to start investing in productivity because without cheap pool of labour that you can pull people in from prices will go up wages will go up and and of course businesses to make a profit will have to start investing in those staff uh, investing in the skills and investing in the automation and whatever it might be to to, to increase productivity as you've, you've mentioned of course it looks like we may sadly have about three million unemployed very soon um and and that is going to create an internal cheap pool of labor now clearly we want those people to get back to work as as quickly as possible but Um, that natural drive for productivity when you have full employment is going to be at least delayed by a few years with the, uh, the outplaying of the effects of lockdown. 
Yeah, I, th- I think that that's that's uh, true in a sense. I think in in terms of the way that you uh, achieve that innovation and rising productivity, though, I think it's it's really not probably just going to come from uh, whether there's a pool of cheap labour around, but it has uh, uh, it derives uh, in a much wider sense from a, a, the sort of cultural outlook of our society and. The, one of the problems I think over the past period has been uh, that culturally we've been very risk averse and very uh, anti taking uh, taking the route of experimentation and doing new things because we see the risks of those things rather than the benefits. So for example you've only got to look at the uh, amount of environmental regulation that swamps quite a lot of, of, of what companies uh, industries do uh, and the constraints of that, that puts on new innovative processes coming to the fore because they've always got to meet these sets of of, of regulations that uh, dictate things like energy efficiency, uh, energy it, not in an efficiency sense but in an environmental sense, which quite often is is actually hostile to uh, the the achievement of of more innovative uh, products or processes that we want to see. So I think the chance to address uh, some of those cultural manifestations of being a member of the European Union, and I'm not saying actually that it was the European Union that it, it imposed all of these things on us. In fact, actually, it was the British government that's often been at the forefront of leading these things, albeit via the route of the European Union. So having a, 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 a being prepared to have a, a, a realistic appraisal of these things and, and to transcend them and move beyond them, I thought was one of the benefits of coming out of the European Union. Sadly, all the noises that have been coming out of government, and especially through the pandemic, has been one of reinforcing some of these uh, environmental uh, imperatives as they're seen. Yeah, I mean, we've taken back control, to uh, to coin a phrase there, but uh, it really is up to, to us then to, you know, us and the government and the uh, business to uh, to make the most of the the newfound freedoms that we have and the, the freedoms that we have to to make decisions for ourselves whether that be the government or, or business um, and it's those decisions over the the coming years that will make the difference and make brexit a a success or or otherwise really now obviously we, we spoke a bit last week about the situation with the the george floyd killing in Minneapolis and the Black Lives Matters protests that ensued and the calls for statues to be removed, uh, in particular uh, the uh, the statue of Sedward uh, Colston in Bristol. Well, it seems that Oxford University, or at least Oriel College at Oxford University, has now decided that it will be taking down a statue of Cecil Rhodes. Now, Cecil Rhodes Yes, he was a, a buccaneering imperialist in uh, in Africa, um, diamond merchant, if I recall correctly. Um, problematic to some, obviously, but he was a, a, a bit of a philanthropist when it comes to uh, Oxford University, creating the uh, the Rhodes Scholarship, which uh, a number of uh, left wing politicians have had the benefit of in the past, uh, most notably uh, Bill Clinton, Mike. Should this statue be taken down? No, um, Rhodes needs to stay. Uh, our history is our history. Um, it's not. There's a there's a fundamental difference between the totalitarian regime you've just overthrown, and and removing their their statues and and you know their. Um, I th- I'm thinking at the end of communism, at the end of Nazism, at the end of Saddam Hussein's uh, rule, and that kind of thing. And removing all vestiges of your country's history, which is, seems to be the the desire at the moment. The Rhodes Scholarship paid for a huge number of people to go through um, university, and I believe, in fact, uh, part of it was that no one should be denied um, a scholarship based on race, which, you know, at the time was frankly a fairly enlightened view for him to take. Um, it, it just this isn't. This isn't done in a way that says, look, it doesn't make sense to have Rose. Something's moved on. The scholarship's wound up. We've got new models we want to put up there. It's a done from a culturally Marxist viewpoint that that we need to end this society that that frankly 
for all its faults, is is pretty good. When when and where else in in all of human history would you prefer to be alive than now and in the Western world? Um, the fact that it's not ideal is the fact that nothing's ideal, um, and it's it's a, a very very bad trend. It felt like most of my adult life up until say. 10 years ago and certainly in the last few years that we were generally speaking moving in the right direction um we were uh, racial divisions were going down um uh, people being persecuted for uh their gender their religion their um uh, sexual preferences was going down it feels like every chance right now is being put into divide society which is you know terribly terribly worrying alistair where do you stand on this uh, issue of statues um well the thing that i found really fascinating over the last few days is uh, you mentioned at the start uh, dan that uh, this all started with george george floyd and uh, the situation in minneapolis but how far removed that seems now from the current discussion uh, i mean i was uh, you know as, as an observer of uh, american politics for for a long time now um the the protests in america uh, as over police brutality were uh, entirely understandable and the american criminal justice system and uh, the ongoing levels of of uh, informal segregation within american society are, are, are incredible in the, in the in the 21st century and you could understand how that anger uh, manifested itself at the start and similarly I, I could understand to some extent the protests in britain as well because people have been locked up there is a lot of dissatisfaction uh, amongst younger people who feel ignored and their their views not taken into account so as a kind of release valve you could understand how that happens but that seems a mile away from uh, the discussion that's taking place today around uh, the, the removal of statues which seems uh, less political actually and less a sign of anti-racism and more a sign of the kind of identity wars and culture wars that have uh, come about over over the last few years and I I uh, don't think the statue should remove, be removed either I, I, I not because I think that statues should never be removed I mean I I, I think that's that's uh, daft that uh, society always goes through a process of uh, assessment and reassessment of who it wants to acknowledge within the public sphere and I think it's entirely legitimate at times that uh, these things through a discussion that involves uh, society uh, takes a decision as to who they want to memorialize but I, I am against it because this seems like a, almost like a cultural war uh, against uh, our, our history and um, I think the the, the I, I, I'm not so much protective of the statues as much as resistant to the forces of uh, reaction that I think are driving this movement to tear them down. And I, I've got real problems with uh, some of the stuff that the Black Lives Matters movement are arguing for, which um, doesn't, to me, uh, sit within any viable, worthwhile anti-racist tradition, which I was always proud to be part of for many years. Well, the August uh, institution, The Guardian, which uh, would certainly describe itself as being uh, a very anti-racist and progressive newspaper, has now got a petition up against it uh, demanding that it's shut down because the, the Mail and the Sun have now been highlighting that uh, The Guardian was a pro-Confederacy newspaper uh, back during the uh, the American Civil War. Uh, as mentioned last week, they were... Uh, they were funded by uh, the uh, the cotton mills uh, up in Manchester, so you can perhaps understand uh, slightly where they were coming from. Um, but it seems that the uh, the Guardian is uh, now on the back foot on this. Mike, interesting times for the Guardian. Like Saturn, the revolution devours its children, is I believe the phrase. I mm -hmm. won't try it in French. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, I don't think that you should... In, in a logical sense, clearly, the people, as much as I might not like The Guardian or anything it stands for, um, are the people that are working at and running and buying The Guardian today shouldn't be penalised because 150 years ago, a completely different set of people took some really bad views on the American Civil War. But that's not the standard The Guardian holds people to, and, and they should 
surely hold themselves to to the same standard they expect to hold others to um and it's just really really funny is, is it amusing for you alistair uh not really no I, I i think um i despair actually uh because it's into a tit-tat battle over uh who gets to say what which is even more threatening to a public sphere uh of open discussion and debate um just because people are just because the target is the guardian doesn't doesn't mean to say that it's any better uh than the target being whatever the uh left identitarian uh, sphere of the uh, side of the culture wars want to target. So I, I think, you know, I spend my whole life arguing for more views uh, to enlighten the public sphere in, in discussion and debate. And and uh, uh, the idea that The Guardian should be shut down is, is just uh, terrible. Absolutely. No, I, I agree with you on that. There's a bit of schadenfreude there but uh that they shouldn't be uh, shut down for that reason anyway the uh cancellation culture is just getting ridiculous whether it's the guardian or paw patrol um you know certainly with the us at the crony constitutionalists believe that uh, well we believe in free speech and if the uh, if people want to buy the guardian and the guardian wants to say what he wants to say that's absolutely fine by us Al- alistair is of course 100 percent right um but it's been 13 weeks without the pub. I'm just going to enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, I think you've got a few questions for Alistair now. I do indeed. Alistair, thank you again for joining us. Uh, great to talk to you. Um, so I want to give people, first of all, a bit about your background. So you're the Associate Director of the Academy of Ideas and an acting co-convener of the Battle of Ideas Festival. Can you tell us a bit about these roles and the festival itself? Uh, Yeah, so the Academy of Ideas was set up uh, 20 years ago uh, to try and, I suppose, re-enliven the public sphere. It was obviously a time, early uh, 21st century, when politics had become uh, much more dull and technocratic and managerial right the way throughout the the, the, the 1990s. Discussion uh, and debate was uh, uh, diminishing. Uh, And so we wanted uh, to try and create situations, whether through organizing public debates or organizing public festivals that could reanimate reanimate public discussion. Uh, So that's uh, effectively what the Battle of Ideas uh, does. We've uh, run the festival for 15 years now. It started off uh, life uh, fairly small, grew uh, uh, to uh, inhabit the Royal College of Art over in West London and for a number of years, eight, nine years now has been at the Barbican. And it's a festival that attracts three and a half thousand people over the course of a weekend uh, discussing all sorts of different subjects from the future of the economy to the rise of the culture wars uh, with an emphasis on uh, free speech and arguing for freedom. So uh, we put together panels and organise debates, uh, making sure that we cover uh, lots of different viewpoints. Similarly, we chat an audience that uh, comes from uh, you know, quite a wide number of perspectives, young and old. Uh, and we feel that by putting people in the same space, then you can create a, a, a lively public space. And I think, you know, one of the things that you start to worry about just now in, in this period of, of pandemic is the dissolving of that public space, the the way that we've become atomized and isolated with our own spheres, the, the common way of speaking to each other has become Zoom, where you're all, you appear as a picture, each an individual cell seems indicative of the way that uh, there's been a, a, a an increasing collapse of the public sphere over the past three months. So we're uh, desperate to get back out there again and bring people together in, in debate and discussion. Obviously, you say it's been around a number of years now. How did you first get involved in the ideas movement and how did you uh, end up in these roles? Well, we we create a a very big festival with a very small uh, team in the office. There's only about six of us. Um, And so consequently, the way that we uh, do the festival is that we work with all sorts of different people who are experts in their fields, whether that be uh, who are experts in technology or genetics or uh, who are historians or or whatever. Uh, And they can uh, bring to the festival uh, insights that we uh, that go beyond the experiences and the knowledge of of people
people within the office team. And uh, my involvement uh, in the festival dates back from uh, way before I worked in the office when I uh, used to organise debates on cities and architecture, which was is, is my background um, and which I had uh, enough expertise and insight into to be able to organise interesting public debates within the context of the festival. So it's, uh, it's, it's a role that uh, then developed through uh, being within the, the, the production team. Uh, and I, uh, you know, I'm now a, a core member of the producer team. As part of that, uh, you, you spoke at our, my, my Tuppenthworth event last year, so thank yes. you for that, really good. Uh, you were speaking about the risks to freedom from identity politics, and obviously we've touched on some of that at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you think it's a concern. What, what, what do you see, where do you see that at at the moment? Well, the other side of what I do uh, is, as, a, as well as working for the Academy of Ideas, I work for uh, an associated charity called the Battle of Ideas Charity, which is uh, more educational in its ethos and, and uh, interests. And within that, uh, we not only organise schools debates and uh, put on uh, weekends of discussion on things like philosophy and history, but I also run... Uh, a school for 18 to 25 year olds called Living Freedom, uh, which is part, is is about attracting a, a new generation of people to uh, become interested in fighting for freedom. And we very much uh, like to interest them by looking back and looking at uh, ideas of freedom throughout history and uh, also their contemporary manifestations and, and constraints. And one of the main things that we found ourselves talking about in the past two or three years is the influence of the culture wars and uh, the emergence and consolidation of, of um, instead of people becoming interested in politics in the traditional sense where they might go off and join political parties, for example, and uh, argue about how to create a political future, they become much more interested in their own identity and their group identities. And that becomes really the focus of, of uh, how they uh, both see themselves, but also how they interpret their role in the world. And one of our concerns over the past period has become the way that uh, uh, identity politics has coincided with uh, uh, increasingly uh, constrained public sphere. And you only need to look at uh, places like universities, for example, to see that um, the influence of I I identity politics has, has, has be become one where people are, uh, are are worried about opposing views. They see this, they see their own identity uh, as as something that's sacrosanct and should be beyond challenge. So anybody who has a set of different ideas that contrasts with their particular their own identity and the, the, their own outlook um, risks being shut down. And that's the the whole safe space culture that's appeared within within universities. Um, identity politics is is a primary reference for that. And obviously, one of the things that's uh, that's happened, and I shouldn't laugh about it, but but that whole atmosphere and culture has very quickly over the past five, six years spread into mainstream society. So you have newspapers, the New York Times, for example, if you've seen the discussion there over the past week, and to a certain extent, the Times in this country, uh, who are um, the, the editorial teams are having enormous disputes about whether uh, they should be, you know, who should be uh, given comment columns and whether they're going to challenge some of the these identitarian ideas. And ov obviously, within institutions and and increasingly, actually, over the you only got to look at the past week within businesses and corporations, this idea of of identity and and uh, adherence to the idea of Black Lives Matters has led to an enormous number of new constraints on people's ability to speak openly. So challenging or understanding the emergence uh, and progression of identity politics and its influence in constraining freedom within the public sphere has become an incredibly important one for us. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it, uh, if what you say there, you think in our lifetimes how much it's changed from uh, as a child being able to say things like, you know, I can say what I want, it's a free country, to, to just not really feeling that anymore is a, a, a very, very worrying trend. And and one that's accelerating. So on that very note, um, what do you think is the future for free speech in Britain? And how do you think we can get back to a happier path? 
Well, I, th I think there's an enormous challenge just now. I mean, if you look at The Guardian today, for example, you'll see that uh, a number of authors uh, from the uh, agency that's associated, associated with J.K. Rowling have departed because they disagree that she should have uh, the right to speak openly on and put her perspective on uh, trans issues. Um, so that, that idea that uh, we you shouldn't be free to speak is, has, has become incredibly prevalent. I, all uh, it should be said that uh, we should congratulate her agency on uh, not buckling under the pressure that they've been put under to rein Rowling in. They haven't done that, and but that's a rare instance just now. So I think there's there's enormous problems uh, in terms of free speech and freedom. So uh, as, I, as I said. Uh, trying to understand a bit more about how it is that we've got here is 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 a big issue. I think free the the questions questions around free speech today happen in a significantly different way from the way that they have historically, where uh, often it was uh, the upper echelons of society and the state that sought to uh, suppress free speech, often uh, around uh, very heavy handed uh, moral ideas, um, for example, blasphemy or challenging the prevailing ideas on 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 uh, sex. Um, and these days it's it's just changed quite dramatically. So you find that quite often the people that are most concerned about reigning in free speech are actually uh, people who are concerned that they're not up to handling ideas that they disagree with or which they don't like, which is why uh, these these uh, uh, constraints have taken such root within the uh, university and within academia, not necessarily just because of the students, but because of the ideas that have developed within academia uh, from, from the lectures and indeed from the university universities themselves. I mean, it's notable just to go back to the, the Oxford conversation a minute ago, that it's Oxford uh, and Oriel College that are taking down the statue. They've taken that decision. Um, it's it's not the students and they've you know they've been rel under relatively little pressure over the past period on the statue because that debate seemed to have been uh, settled so they so all around we have people caving in uh, to these uh, constraints and I think finding ways to expose and challenge what's going on is is become ever more important yeah no, absolutely and um, so um We've talked a bit about the Academy of Ideas. Obviously, at the moment, you're um, uh, in lockdown with the rest of us. But what's next for the Academy? What projects or events have you got coming up once we can hold them again? Um, well, we have been in lockdown, uh, but all of us are still working, um, working very hard, actually, because we've put on about 30 different online discussions over the past, uh, well, however long it is we've been locked down, you lose all sets of time just now, don't you? Um, so, which are all actually available on, on, on our website. So if you want to track back and look at any of them, we've had discussions on things like the role of the media, on the role of experts uh, in, in the pandemic, on uh, trying to understand more about uh, safety culture and uh, We've had discussions on uh, well the impact of of uh, the killing of George Floyd on British society. So we've tried over the past three months to uh, uh, very much to create a public discussion around what's going on because as as I said earlier, I think the the absence of a public sphere at the moment is 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 uh, incredibly worrying. Um, in terms of what's coming up, well, <laughs> we're still locked down uh, and it's not clear at the moment. Uh, the, how quickly we're going to be able to emerge from that. So we have uh, more online discussions. We've got one on Tuesday, for example, which will uh, look at uh, uh, how the NHS has responded to this crisis, not just uh, in the narrow sense, but just looking at some of the issues that actually you raised earlier in this podcast, like were they prepared for a pandemic? And if not, why not? Um, we're going to have a next week. We've got a book launch on uh, a new book on uh, borders. 
uh, with Professor Frank Faraday, which will be looking at why it is that uh, we uh, both seem to love borders just now, but also hate them. So on the one hand, we celebrate uh, safe spaces and putting walls around ourselves. On the other hand, people celebrate cosmopolitanism and uh, talk about free movement and uh, celebrate uh, life without borders. So we want to look at that question of what it is, the meaning of borders and why it is that there's such pro and anti views of them. And then longer term, uh, we'll uh, be preparing for the Battle of Ideas Festival, which hopefully will come at the end of, of the year. We're, we're still hoping that uh, society will open up enough that we can gather people physically within the same space, hopefully beyond social distancing. And we'd love to uh, have the Battle of Ideas Festival uh, in, in November, because let's face it, there's no shortage of issues to discuss just now. No, absolutely. And, and on that very point, what, what are the issues, what are the ideas that are interesting you most at the moment? I'm interested in, in the uh, uh, the future of cities and how that discussion on cities plays out and, and, and whether uh, some of the stuff that's come around on a pandemic, which is very much about limiting the public sphere, will actually take root. And obviously, I'm interested in arguing against that. Well, also, uh, freedom is, is a big issue. But there's there's huge uh, discussions and debates just now around the culture wars around the future of institutions i mean have you know the police the nhs uh, the universities what is their future they all seem to uh, be undergoing huge amount of reorganization just now at precisely the time when a new set of ideas is coming to the fore in society and I would argue not good ideas so there's a danger that these are being baked into these new institutions that are being reorganized without much democratic debate um, so we want to look at all these things and try and uh, uh, both understand them a bit better but also debate the extent to which they should be challenged and if so what uh, some alternatives might be. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Well, it was great to talk to you, Alistair, and thanks for uh, your time on the podcast today. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Alistair. That was uh, that was great. Most uh, most insightful. Well, Mike, we've got a few uh, pieces on our website that we've uh, put up recently that uh, could keep people busy uh, whilst they're in lockdown. Uh, what have we got up there now? Well, I was going to say, if people uh, can find some time after all those uh, excellent things that uh, Alistair's mentioned there to uh, have a look at from the Academy of Ideas, then I would recommend, first of all, having a look at an article from the Libertarian Party of Canada. We've uh, reached out to our brethren across the seas and, and spoken to them about some of what they do and, and some of their views. A couple of quotes here, uh, one about uh, Pr uh, Prime Minister Trudeau. Uh, he's terribly over his head to become Prime Minister. There's nothing on his resume suggesting he has the capacity to deliver on his promises. And the cost of living has gone up significantly. Taxes have gone up. So um, have a read through. Uh, really interesting on on views of liberty in Canada. Um, Crispin Williams, who many of you may be familiar with in Croydon, um, uh, have done a lot of stuff around Brexit over the years. Um, he's written a piece on House of Lords reform, making the point that the growth in the number of overtly political lords lessens the one big advantage of the House, that it should be scrutinising and revising chamber with little political agenda. He's put a view of what he, how he thinks the House of Lords should be organised. We've asked at the end of that, if you've got a view, come and write into us, let us know. Um, we've already had some response on that, so um, look forward to getting them up for future weeks and uh, have a read and let us know. And then lastly, from uh, Jeremy Wraith, uh, we've had an article about the EU and, and uh, the, the title rather amusingly is Angela Merkel unwittingly endorses Brexit as good for Britain. And he points out some of the things that uh, Angela Merkel has declared and, and how that really is good for Britain's reason to leave and, and to get fully completed on Brexit. So again, have a read. Uh, let us know what you think. Thanks. Yes. Well, uh, yes, some interesting articles are from uh, from Crispin and Jerry, who uh, have obviously local people who've written to us. And if uh, you'd like to write for our website or have any stories you'd like us to cover, please do contact us via the Twitter at Croydon Const, via our Facebook page, via our website, CroydonConstitutionalist.uk, or via email, CroydonConstitutionalist at gmail.com. 
Well, do please uh, subscribe to the podcast and the uh, the podcast, and uh, do please also subscribe to the YouTube channel. Do please like, share, and uh, and feel free to leave a review. We uh, we always like feedback, and it helps others to find the podcast. Just like to say thanks to Alistair for joining us today. Hope it wasn't too painful. No, I enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And finally, thanks to everybody for listening. Until next time, it's goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. Stay safe, everybody. 